everybody. Welcome to Tabio Poetica. We have had an amazing reading series this fall, and we're going to conclude the whole series with the MFA poets reading on December 11th. Is that the right date? December 11th at 4 p.m. in the Center for American War Letters in the basement of the library. So please join us for um, some of our own students reading their work. We also have a special lecture titled Leaving War on a Bridge of Words. That's by Presidential Fellow and Poet Carolyn Forche on Wednesday, December 6th at 7 p.m. also in the Center for American War Letters. Uh, put that on your calendar. That's a must-see lecture. Please take a moment to silence your cell phone as you're pulling it out to check that it's silenced. Tweet or Facebook that you're here at Tabula Poetica having a fantastic time. Most of the support for the visiting poets and for the International Journal tab comes from the English department. I especially want to thank our department chair, Joanna Levin, and our administrative assistants, Kristen Lasso, and also David Krausman, who's here. So go ahead and give him a round of applause. David really makes sure that these events happen. Um, he does a lot of behind the scenes work. Leatherby Libraries, Fish Interfaith Center, where you are now, and poets and writers continue to support our talks and readings. Um, I want to mention that this visiting poet today was really generous recently, and uh, she uh, coordinates the Tufts Poetry Award. And she had some extra poetry books, and she gave them to a poet who drove down boxes of poetry books that are now in our library. So that's the kind of literary citizenship that keeps us all reading and keeps us reading new work. So I want to specifically thank our visiting poet today for that. My colleague, Logan Estale, is going to introduce today's poet. Thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, I, uh, I, I hope to say a few things which might connect with what our visiting speaker will be talking about, but I don't know. That's the surprise. That's the <laughs> uh, one thing I like about Genevieve Kaplan's work is its interest in the act of seeing and how seeing is a kind of reading and reading is a kind of seeing. A poem, as I see it in her work, is a space in which to look for something and then finding something else. Even if the poet herself doesn't see and highlight it, her poem is a record of what was seen and the reader may find it. This is a reading experience, to look and be looked at. One of Kaplan's poems begins with the phrase, as gnats flitting in the tall grasses. Can you picture that? Gnats with the G, flitting in the tall grasses. I imagine these gnats are not easy to see unless you are an insect or bird or a poet. Another poem titled, Several of Nature's People, is a line from Emily Dickinson's poem that starts, A Narrow Fellow in the Grass. Dickinson's poem is about seeing a snake. Even if we don't see it, the poem says, but only the movement of the grasses as the snake unwinds away, it has seen us. And even when it clearly wants to avoid us, we feel a fright. A quote, you know this poem? This, this is a couple lines from the poem that may, you may remember. We feel a tighter breathing and zero at the bone. Another Kaplan poem is titled Three Insects, which I'm going to take kind of seriously, but I think the title's kind of funny too, in a good way. <laughs> Three Insects. And this particularly reminds me of what Gertrude Stein does in her book Tender Buttons, which a lot of uh, the audience here is my class intro to poetry, and we've been talking about Stein, so this is for them in part. Sorry, Jennifer. <laughs> so maybe you'll enjoy it. I don't mind at all so far. Yeah. Um, 
So this particularity of three insects reminds me of something in Tender Buttons where we see phrases such as piece of coffee and cream cut. Stein's book unsettles our tendency to lump things together, to massify. Instead, it asks that we see things one by one. Cream and coffee are not normally in pieces or cut into pieces. So too, three insects, one and one and one. For a poet who moves from interior spaces out into the natural world, as Kaplan does, a fundamental issue is scale. A painting of three insects will freeze them in a pose, their flitting becomes still, and they will likely be magnified, larger than life. In an interview, Kaplan has said that she is interested in poems as objects, quote, on a larger scale, maybe even, unquote, maybe even billboard size. So there's scale which magnifies and there's scale, or there's, there's magnifying something in order to see it, and then there's, strangely, ironically perhaps, there's a way of seeing in which something has been miniaturized, and it's, that, that play with scale draws our attention. Uh, thinking of Dickinson again, uh, a couple of lines from one of her poems, you cannot, this is Dickinson from one of her poems, you cannot fold a flood and put it in a drawer. But when you read those lines, you think she's trying to fold a flood and put it in a drawer. Uh, my sense is that Kaplan is like Dickinson, and Dickinson, among other things, is definitely a poet of scale and playing with scale. Is interested, Kaplan is interested in how poetry can make the small big and the big small, and writing a poetry that can play with scale so that we can see these things. A few details, uh, details about Genevieve Kaplan, and then I'll turn things over to her. Uh, among other things, what you heard a hint of, she's involved in many things, community building and sustaining. Uh, she co-edits with Sean Berner something called the Toad Press International Chapbook Series, which is which sounds really interesting. Since 2004, they've published at least 25 chapbooks uh, of uh, translations of poetry and prose. Um, so she it, it works with writers, translators from all over the world, I think. Is that right? Yeah. And um, Kaplan herself has published three chapbooks. The titles of the chapbooks are uh, Settings for These Scenes, Travelogue, and In an Aviary. And she has a full-length book in the Ice House, and I'm sure we'll see more from her, so keep your eyes out. Um, and her website is one place to go. She did undergraduate studies at UC Santa Cruz. Uh, she has an MFA from the Iowa Writers' Workshop, and I believe she's currently doing her PhD at USC. I finished it a few years ago. Oh, yeah. <laughs> 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 All right, Dr. Kaplan. Completed. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for that great introduction. Thank you all for being here. I'm really excited to be with you on our first day back after the Thanksgiving holiday. So I feel like we might as well dive right into poetry and poetics, right? Um, I'm really excited to be here talking with you all today. And I'm, I also really appreciate you making the time to spend with my work to begin with, to be here with me, to listen to me, to look at some of my slides. Hopefully, I'll see you at my reading later, too. We'll find out. Um, so today, I'm going to be doing a craft talk on what I am calling multi-textual poetries and necessary poetics. I just decided on that name a couple days ago. So I don't know exactly what it means yet, but I think it means what I'm gonna be talking about. So you'll also see that I take the idea of a craft talk fairly literally, so I'm actually gonna be talking about crafting as well as poetry making. And I should say that I'm gonna read a little bit because I'm a bad expository speaker, so I apologize if I'm looking at the paper, but I did bring slides for you so you can look at those and feel engaged that way, I'm hoping. That's my hope. 
So multi-textual poetry is a necessary poetics. As a poet and book artist myself, as well as a scholar, I've long been invested in the generative processes of both writing poems and creating the book, Spe specifically the artist's book and the poem as it may exist outside of book form and the reception of such work in the literary and academic community. This afternoon, I'd like to discuss some of my preliminary notes on these subjects, a sort of broad overview of the types of work done by others that intrigues me, as well as an introduction into some of my own investigations into the potential relationship between the acts of writing and creating book objects, and questions about writing as a physical, visual, or tactile act. I have something of a background in letterpress printing, weaving, book arts, and while I've continued my interest in and study of artist books, focusing my scholarship on poetry in the artist book format, visual erasure, and literary collage, for the most of my poetic career, I've focused on a more traditional poetics of the page. But recently, I fell into a bit of a writer's block funk, and I returned to some of my book arts techniques as a way to escape that funkiness. But I was coming at the project in a different aim. My aim wasn't to make books, but to really think about the creation of the artist's book as an extension of and complement to my drafting process. So first, a little about my general process that you'll see in the images here. As a writer, I keep notebooks, and these notebooks are always full of language that I can use to make poems. So I always have materials, words, at my disposal. But the poems that I was drafting out of these notebooks felt kind of flat and uninspiring. So maybe, I thought, my block wasn't so much about the writing, but more about the funk of the poetic form or the lack of places I could see the form going, a dissatisfaction with the possibilities of the poem on the page. So I got out my copy of Alyssa Golden's Making Handmade Books, I recommend this, Making Handmade Books, and my typewriter, and I went from there. I let the form that I selected, the space of the page, the mistakes I might make while typing, dictate, limit, and expand the text of the poem I might write. I'll start by showing you what form these recent draft experiments took. The first, the one on this slide here, is a snake book containing the poem, or something like a poem, titled For Locating the Room. In For Locating the Room, the number of pages or squares was limited to 13, and the size of the page was small. This form starts with an eight and a half by 11 piece of paper, and I visually laid out the squares so I knew roughly where the folds would be, how the poem that I was about to write would progress. Then I chose a couple pages from my notebook, and I looked for phrases that rose to the surface. I typed these phrases on each of the squares where I thought they might fit, where I thought they might resonate with each other. Finally, I cut and folded the page into this book form. In the pocket book form for You See Me, I had six pockets, but potentially countless poems or snippets that I might fill them with. I folded the book first, and then I typed up the lines or the phrases that would fit to insert into the pockets. And then I arranged and rearranged the poetic fragments to see if I might make something of them. These little green books allowed me to enter a different compositional framework, to have a different awareness of how the poem might be created and how the poem might progress or unfold. The most important things about them, for me, at the time of their creation, was the sense of playfulness and experimentation, as well as the fact of their physical work, the measuring, cutting, arranging, pressing the, no the noisy keys of the typewriter keyboard. These objects are neither artist books nor poems. I thought of them as sort of drafts of both, as studies for something larger and better and more interesting someday in the future. Playing with the book form also allowed me to begin thinking about presenting the poem beyond the page. So this slide shows a further movement of one of my poems, here slipping entirely off the page and into the garden. Here is Love, is the poetic installation that I created last year, attaching hand-sewn lines of a poem to the arms of a cactus. 
This visual and tactile experiment was successful in that it encouraged readers or viewers to have an encounter with a poem in a way they might not have expected. The cactus loomed over them. They had to physically move their heads or bodies to read the next line. The colors of the poem changed as the sun moved across the yard. Innocuous seeming phrases like pincushions and biting lilies took on new and charged context when juxtaposed with the factually prickly spines of the cactus. The idea of tactility or physical form or structures having some influence over content isn't a new one, of course. Scholar, book artist, and poet Joanna Drucker has made what is essentially a lifelong study of these questions. In a short interview, she describes an early experience in printing and working with lead type. This is a quote from her. You have to start with a completely different relationship to the words. What is a heavy word? What is a light word? What is a short word? When you run out of letters in a box of type and you realize that you're not going to be able to say something that you were about to say, and you're just suddenly, whoa, because there's no more Ms, and you think, well, how am I going to say mother? Or how am I going to say murmur? End quote. Drucker defines an artist book as a book which is a record of its own making a description that I would like to find apt for poetry as well. I'm interested in considering the poem as a made thing, a piece of writing that calls attention not only to sound and to language and to music, but also to the process or the work that led to its creation. How can this happen? When have we encountered poems that emphasize process in this way? You might be familiar with Susan's, Susan Hauer, Susan's I can't even say this, Susan Howe's work. Are you? Do you all know Susan Howe at all? I'll tell you about it, and then you'll want to read it. You should. So I find her book, The Midnight, um, which is from 2003, in particular embodies this kind of process act, making mundane research or daily life processes an explicit part of the literary project. In The Midnight, for example, Howe describes walking into the Houghton Library at Harvard, where she is conducting research in special collections for the book that will become The Midnight. Approaching the doors, she writes, quote, the only metal fitting in each glass consists of a polished horizontal bar at waist height a visitor must pull to open. I enter an oval vestibule about 10 feet wide and five to six feet deep. Before me, double doors again, again, plate glass, end quote. These descriptions continue and how takes four pages to detail her journey from the front door of the library to her table in special collections, where she will research and eventually begin to write poems. Howe's specificity allows readers to imagine in an almost participatory way what the journey to composing poetry is like, and her emphasis on details and doors and bars and lengths and pulling highlights the physical and the figurative difficulty of a tiny moment of that process. What occurs in Howe's collection, The Midnight, is poetry, yes, but that poetry is informed by and surrounded with an abundance of evidence of the work, both thought work and physical work, that has contributed to that poetry. Jill Magi's more recent book, Labor, seems a direct descendant of Howe's The Midnight in the way that it takes archives, access to archives, incorporation of archival materials, and emphasis on the process of accumulating information as both topic and product. Magi describes Labor, a book that is simultaneously investigation, commentary, and conceptual art as, quote, a fiction, and, quote, an installation. It is also, of course, a poetry. How's the Midnight includes images of items, letters, documents, found objects, encountered during the research and writing process. Magi's labor includes some quoted and found language and instructions for art making. For example, in her recurring poem, Handbook, she writes, quote, total up all the linear feet in the archive, go to Midtown and buy the corresponding yardage in transparent fabrics, and place these billowing textures over the documents, over the shelves in the labor archive, tucked into box lids, tucked into the spaces between boxes." End quote. Later she instructs, quote, copy by hand each page of the archive's finding guide. Optional, videotape this performance. End quote. However, there are no photographs, no evidence of this work included in the actual book labor, 
but we can find visual accompaniment, the installation part of labor, on Magi's website and elsewhere beyond the covers of the book. In a 2015 interview, Magi explains, I work with textiles, and there's a huge body of thinking about textiles and touch. I actually made boxes, lined them with fake fur, and put documents in them while I was writing labor. Those addendum practices that are documented in the book, I actually did some of these things. I'm not sure why. The subject matter and content of the book Labor and the images and accompanying discussions emphasize the physical time-consuming actions that have gone into the work of the writing, lines and phrases that could look on the page deceptively simple. As writers, we all know the effort and hard work that goes into the literary product, the poem or the essay or the story. What writers like Howe and Magi are doing through their inclusion of supportive images and their insistently descriptive and at times even defensive seeming content and by their surrounding of the literary text with objects and descriptions and justifications is drawing attention to this work that readers aren't often invited to see, the work that often goes unnoticed. I'm interested in how we can allow or even make poetry do this even more. Both, both Howe and Magi make the poem seem like a struggle, a beautiful, artful struggle, and that's a tension that I like. If what I want to see more of is the poem as a record, one question I have is how best to record it. One way I'm attracted to is through the visual. Concrete poems, physical installations, and artist books all seem like potentially good ways to proceed. I'm interested in poems that are dependent on their visual experience and vice versa. And I'm interested in knowing when a poem and its visual counterpart add to each other or can be experienced separately. I'm interested in seeing the work of creating the poem depicted visually. Right now, I'm still at the point where I'm asking a lot of questions and looking deeper into other works I've identified as potentially achieving this visual or verbal tension. I'm interested in Jen Bourbon's recently published Silk Poems, a book of poetry that includes visual elements and is grounded in scientific, archival, and experiential research. And it was also paired with a Mass Mocha visual video exhibit um, at a museum in New York. The Work Shy, a recent publication by the Blunt Research Group, uses institutional archives as the basis for erasure poems that give voice to dead and forgotten residents of work camps, prisons, and psychiatric institutions. The volume frames these found poems with descriptions of research as well as archival images. In a more visual example, poet and artist Stephanie Schlafer created a salt and letterpress stop action film of her poem titled The Mouse and Me. In this short piece, we see the salt moving, we see the letters appearing, we see the artist slash author's hand wipe away the letters in the final shot. This demonstration of the materiality and tactility of letters, of the poem, of action, of work, I like that a lot. Schlafer uses another art form, which is salt, letters, and film, to make the poem into a multi-level experience for the reader. My current project, too, I hope invites the reader to have a multi-sensory experience with the poem. I've been creating a series of woven broadsides, sewing and weaving poems into fuzzy, tactile, and I hope sort of beautiful pieces that could be hung on the wall as art as well as red. So this is the top half of one of my broadsides. I'm very happy with some aspects of this piece. Yet while I think the broadside draws attention to the goals I'm interested in, presenting the poem as a visual record of its own making, presenting the creation of the poem as a labor-intensive pursuit, presenting the poem as a beautiful object to experience. I'm not certain the finished pro project always fully conveys what I'm after. This is the bottom half of the previous, so the, second, the bottom of the completed broadside. So let me describe my process. To create these works, I first write out a line of poetry by hand, then I sew the letters of my poem on a ribbon to form words and phrases, the lines of the poem, and then I weave the ribbons together to create the material, the poem. So far, I'm finding this process takes a really long time. It does. But I think I'm getting somewhere really interesting, in part because the sewing and weaving process is so time consuming, and I'm allowing myself to be consumed a bit by it. <laughs> 
The sewing time becomes a time to allow myself to think and reflect on the letter, on the word, on the poem, on the project, on the process. And I've been asking myself more questions. Do I care more about representing poetic labor, more about poetic process, about the reader's experience? It varies. I think the photos of the in-progress sewings, like this, in some way, better represent both labor and process. For example, these photos of the bro, brow, brown, brown sequence highlight the materiality of the letters that create the word brown. So the sequence reminds viewers that bro and brow come first and are necessary components of the larger word. These photos also emphasize the slowness of my own process of sewing slash writing. You can see the thread has shifted, that the angle of the camera has changed slightly with each image. I'm demonstrating not the labor it takes to hand write or think up the word brown, but the labor that it takes to sew the word brown on a piece of ribbon and to pause and photograph that work. The time it takes to look from one photo to the next echoes, though it doesn't really replicate the length of time needed to sew the letter W, the letter N, the final period. I'm drawing attention in that way to the materiality of the word. I'm also struck by the way that I'm making the word material, I mean literally. First, I'm making the poetic line a physical line by embroidering letters, words, and phrases on top of the thin ribbon. And then later, when I weave the ribbons or lines together, these embroidered lines combine with yarn with other discrete threads to create a larger piece of material, in this case a poem composed of lines that are physically connected. So this is a detail from that previous broadside that I showed you. The finished pieces, what I'm calling the broadsides, are fairly small. They're about 12 by 18. And while the pieces are inherently visual, my sewn letters are only about a quarter of an inch high. So readers need to get up close to read the words, to read the poem. The size necessitates that the reader get closer to examine the threads, the fuzziness of the weft, the not quite straight lines of the warp, the way the words of the poem pull at the warp and give it what can appear to be movement. The, inviting, the invited reading is not only of text, but also of texture. The, reader, the reading experience is verbal, visual, and also tactile. My stone and woven exper experiments and the preliminary notes that I've shared with you, as well as others' important work that we haven't really gotten into here, I think these reveal the compelling necessity to continue our inquiry and explorations of the relationship between form and content and the potential of developing this relationship further. As poet artists, like ourselves, you all are, right? Yeah, as poet artists, um, continue conceptualizing and creating pieces that demonstrate interdependence between form and labor and craft and content and readers or viewers are invited to encounter such work we need to be able to think carefully and clearly about our roles. We are readers, critics, crafters, writers, thinkers, and responders. And ultimately, we will be the ones deciding upon the relevance and necessity of continuing the creation and the conversations surrounding such contemporary, multi-textual, poetic pieces. I would be happy to take questions about any of the things that I've shown you or mentioned. Oh, nice. In 2009. Mm -hmm. um, so she was one of our first Tabula Poetica poets before Tabula Poetica had the name. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it's interesting to come back around to this. When did this start for you as a poet? Because when you when you were sitting in high school literature classes reading poetry, it wasn't like this. What? How? How did you get to this point? You mean like the weaving sewing part? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so it kind of started with, as I told you um, in the talk, like it kind of started with those little book forms. I think they, made, they were making me think about how the poem could exist on a plane that wasn't the flat plane of the page. Um, and so that was something that I wanted to experiment with a little bit more. I, ha I took weaving classes in college because that's what kind of person I am. So I have, I have a little loom. 
And so I, I had been sort of like looking at it and thinking about how I should take it out of the closet and what could I do with it. Um, and so I tried to weave, actually initially tried to weave paper together. Um, like, yeah, it was really, really hard. It was, it was really incredibly difficult. Um, but I thought that thinking about the poem as a fabric, like a literal fabric, would be really interesting. So yeah, it kind of expanded from the page. Like it started with the page and the book, and then I tried to think about where it could go from there. But yeah, I never, I never really thought that this was the form that anything I ever wrote would take. I did not see it coming. It's, I've been working on these broadsides. Um, I was telling Mike during the podcast that a line, like a single line of the poem or the line of ribbon, takes about like half an hour to 45 minutes for me to sew just that line. And the weaving is fairly quick, but the sewing is, is really slow. Um, so I've been working on this for, I think, a little over a year. I've completed like one and a half of these broadsides, and I have, I have a vision that's going to come to fruition. Um, but I think there's going to be five. There's, there are going to be five total. So we'll, we'll see how long that takes. Mm -hmm. My first feeling was, uh, and I hope you laugh, I was, oh no, the cactus. <laughs> uh, yes. You, you, you put those words on the cactus, but then you explained that they were, they were attached somehow. And I think mm -hmm. that was really interesting that, that the, the words are there and they're a part of the cactus and yet you obviously took some some hair and didn't, right? Am I, or am I, am I? Yeah. Or did, or did you harm the cactus? I did not harm the cactus. I was very careful. It was not my cactus also. Um, so I, I did want to be careful not, not to hurt the cactus. And my original idea, I did this for a, for sort of a, a house, like a book launch house party, not for my own book, but for somebody else's. And so we were invited to come and create sort of a poetic installation in her garden. And since I take things literally, I thought, yes, I will install a poem in the garden. And so I had initially thought that I would put it on a tree, like on branches of a tree, and that it would be more horizontal. Um, but when I was looking around the garden and I saw that cactus, I was like, that, that is the thing that my poem belongs on for sure. Um, so it did take, I mean, I like, I measured it, um, and then, so when I first met the cactus, right, we met, I measured it a lot of times, I tried to figure out which line would go on which arm of the cactus, that kind of thing, um, and then I went home and I sewed the poem onto the right size, sort of giant ribbons. I put the, that picture of me on the ladder over there kind of for scale, so you can see that it is, it's a pretty, it's a fairly large cactus, um, it was tough to get things up there. Um, and at first I was thinking that I would just use the spines of the cactus to, to get the poem to stick, um, but it was kind of windy. So I ended up also using some little push pins. Well, not push pins, like sewing pins. And that worked really well. But I checked, like I had a cactus, I have a similar cactus at home, it's not nearly as nice. Um, but I did some test runs where I poked some pins in my cactus and then let it sit for a couple days and then made sure that I hadn't like hurt the cactus. Um, because yeah, I don't want the poem to I don't want the poem to kill the cactus. I want the poem to elevate the cactus. <laughs> Other questions? Yeah. Um, so you throughout this process with the cactus and also then on sewing, mm -hmm. did you feel like that changed your writing in any way? Um, your whole process, not even just with those particular poems, but you as I feel like, well, one thing that's been happening as I've been sewing, um, especially those broadside ones, like the tiny one quarter inch letters, like it's been very, I'm spending a lot of time with my letters, you know? So like I've been, I've become very aware of like how many U's I use in a line or something like that. So I've been, I've become hyper aware of the letters that I'm using or the letters that I sort of rely upon. Um, so that's one thing that happened. And then I feel like because I've been, this has been sort of like an ongoing background project in the rest of my life. Like every day I'm like, I really got to sew a poem today like that. Um, so I feel like the sewing or like the pressure to sew something or to think about the poem as a sewn thing has sort of been, it's just kind of been in the back of my mind when I've been working on other things too. And so I have been recently, like some of my recent poems are, are 
sort of about textiles and textures and sewing in, in a way that I, I have never really written about that before. So I have found the subject matter is now, like it's slipped into my subconscious and it's, it's there and it's holding steady. So, yeah. Because your book, you know, in the first half, is very, um, it's very condensed. Mm -hmm. And the writing is pretty tight. Mm -hmm. Songs are pretty short. And I, I know you probably wrote this before you started Sandstone, or was mm -hmm. it? Yeah. Yeah. So interesting. Like, I wondered if they kind of interrelated at all. And I wonder if the times now are even shorter. <laughs> I think I'm very comfortable in the fragment, like I'm very comfortable working there. And so a lot of these poems, these sewn ones, um, are much longer and I had started writing them before I even knew I was going to sew them. I think as a way to, to like re react against the fragment, um, like I was like, I, I need to be able to do something else too. And so now I, I have also a, a body of very large, like accumulative poems that I, I think are very opposite from those discrete little pieces in the ice house. Mm -hmm. But I also, I mean, I really love the fragment. And given my druthers, like, I will edit down and edit it and edit it and edit it and make something that is this big and have two words and think that is a great poem. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Given the, the time constraints mm -hmm. or the time demands, especially, uh, do you said that you know, it was in your subconscious and you're sort of working on it all the time. But how do you make time for writing? And I think that's a different question for you Mm -hmm. 45 minutes. Mm -hmm. so yeah, it is, it is very difficult. Um, and I, I mean, I am somebody who writes a lot, um, but I don't necessarily write every day. I mean, I would like to. It's a, it's a great goal. And it is always my goal, but I do not always achieve it. Um, but I do try to, like, I tend to write in the morning or at least get up with the intent to begin writing. Um, and I've been using the sewing time, like it's sort of, it has eaten into my writing time, so I've been spending more time working on this project than necessarily like generating new things. But I've also been doing it kind of simultaneously, so like one day I'll sew a line, the next day I'll work on a poem, the next day I'll come back and work on, you know, a word that I didn't finish sewing the previous day. Um, so it, it's been sort of, I think, just kind of infused with my writing and my writing time, and I have found that the that the sewing time, as I said, I, it is very meditative and reflective in a, in a nice way that I think has made me slow down in terms of writing poems and really think about what I want a poem to be or how I might want a poem to progress while I'm working on that sewing. So even if I'm not necessarily writing a poem at that time, I'm thinking about poetry. So it's there. I think one of the things that I love most about poetry is that I think it's fun um, and I really like the playfulness that poetry has and I like thinking about the words as pieces or as things that I can move around and that they, they can become anything. Um, and I feel like sometimes, I don't know, in school or in classes, there's people are very serious or, you know, like you're, sometimes people are thinking too much about what they mean or their emotions or what they want to get across or how other people are going to receive their poems, um, which is great. Like those are all great things and you want to be aware of those. But what I really like is trying to think about doing something new with the poem or trying to think about how the poem can do something new for me, for my own writing, um, how I can continually change along with the poem. And so I think like I would recommend somewhere in like, I don't know, in your left pinky finger or something, just keep like a little playfulness in there and try to infuse it into your poetry so that you don't get stuck in like the, the seriousness of poems. Serious poems are great, but then they just need like a little wiggle on the side, I think. All right, thank you very much.